morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the Institute of Historical Research. My name is Lawrence Goldman, and I'm the director here. And I'm delighted uh, to see you all. Uh, I'm particularly delighted uh, that we have the ambassador of the Netherlands, Mr. Simon Smith, here this morning as well to start us off. Um, this is an important day for the Institute because we're honoring uh, one of our very own, uh, because we consider Peter Hale one of uh, ours. Um, we were founded in 1921, and if you go up to the third floor, to the exhibition area on the third floor, you'll find a letter in which he donated part of his library to the IHR in 1921, as soon as it was found. He obviously had great hopes and enthusiasm for us, and uh, nearly 100 years later, uh, we're still here. By 1925, Peter Gale had set up the Low Countries Seminar in uh, Dutch, uh, the Low Countries History, uh, which still runs. It's one of our most thriving seminar. Of course, people involved in the seminar are here today and will be talking to you, uh, and we're delighted that they have been involved. Um, I also know that by that stage as well, he was teaching a third year undergraduate special subject from documents on Dutch history, and he held the classes in the IHR as well. So clearly we were very important to Gail, and uh, for us this is a bit like a uh, sort of coming home event uh, as we honor one of our own. But he was a man, of course, of much wider political and intellectual significance, and I know we're going to find out a great deal about that today. Um, I have one major thank you to make, and it is to really the organizer of this conference, uh, Dr. Stein Van Rossen, who uh, is our library fellow at present here in the IHR, where he's been working on our Dutch collections, cataloging them, uh, and working out the provenance um, of uh, the very large collection of early modern Dutch pamphlets, which we hold. Um, and it was Stein's idea to hold this conference, a wonderful idea, I think, uh, which touches so many bases uh, for the IHR. Um, and I do want to thank you for drawing us all together um, uh, and making this possible. Uh, he will speak in a moment, but I'm going to hand over to the ambassador, uh, who will welcome us as well. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to uh, say a few words of welcome uh, at this uh, symposium about uh, Peter Gale, as you say, yeah. we say Gale. Um, it's not an everyday <coughs> occurrence that such uh, an august uh, company, group of academics from London, Belgium, I think, Germany as well, uh, gathers for uh, oh, what is almost a whole day. Um, to exchange their knowledge and opinions about just one Dutchman. But in this case, I think it's obvious because uh, Peter Gale was uh, not only one of our, as in Dutch, our uh, internationally most well-known historians, he, he was quite a bit more. Um, he was a very uh, a productive writer on a wide uh, range of uh, topics. Uh, and apart from reading everything he could, uh, about uh, French literature and uh, philosophers. Um, he had literary ambitions of his own uh, and he even wrote um, detective stories as well as poetry. Uh, about his character, uh, we know, and I think we'll hear more about this uh, today, that he had a, a rather polemic, um, pugnacious, I think he was called, <laughs> by Tornby. Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, mindset and, uh, and that he loved a good debate or, or even uh, at times uh, a row uh, and, and from his autobiographical work which uh, I think was published by him after his death we also know that he was a keen womanizer uh, I don't know whether that's where the word geilaard in uh, Dutch uh, comes from but it must have some bearing on his reputation maybe uh, now, in a way, I think he, he would have or could have been more um, at home in the 19th rather than uh, the 20th century. Um, what we don't know much about, however, is um, Peter Hale's work in London for the uh, National 
bureau for documentation uh, about uh, the Netherlands. It was founded, this bureau, in 1918 um, by influential individuals from the business community and um, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, my uh, current employer, uh, collecting information uh, about the Netherlands. Um, the neutrality of the Netherlands during uh, the First World War had, of course, provoked some negative feedback, uh, particularly among the uh, Entente uh, powers. Uh, you will hear more about Gael, Gael uh, and World War I by Professor Len Dorschmann this afternoon. Uh, and may I say on a, a personal note, um, Len and I were classmates um, at grammar school some decades ago. I will not tell you how many decades, but it's a couple of decades. And it, it gives me great pleasure, Lane, to, uh, to meet up uh, again. Um, this bureau, of course, wished to improve um, the position of the Netherlands by means of its own information gathering and dissemination. And these days, we would call um, this type of um, uh, action, we, we would call it public diplomacy, and in those ways, uh, I think it was a rather new approach on, uh, on foreign policy. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, of course, uh, Peter used the budget of the National Bureau to build up an impressive library, which I had a distinct pleasure of uh, seeing in his part uh, this morning. Um, and this, it's really, I think, one of the hidden uh, treasures of this institute. Uh, and, um, Stein, organizer of the symposium, I, I think uh, you, you did a great job you know, not organizing this, but also mm -hmm. opening opening this gem, I think you could call it, uh, up. Um, I, I don't know if uh, the sponsors and, and the authorities and the Netherlands have a, a library of this volume in mind when they handed the job to Peter Gale and, and a carte blanche, if you like. Uh, but I, I think he did. He made some wise moves with his budget, let's say. Uh, because it's a legacy that is certainly uh, very much uh, worthwhile. So I wish you all a, a wonderful day. Um, I can highly recommend the library if you have time to see it, have a fruitful discussion, and um, if you have some time left, go up and see this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Make a move. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for these kind uh, introductions, of course. I'm very glad to see you all here uh, today. Uh, I'm glad that so many specialists and people interested in the life and work of the email are, are here uh, today. And of course, I have to say, I didn't uh, organize this day alone. This is a, a joint organization with uh, uh, the Twitter from UCL. And uh, so I'm very glad uh, for also uh, his uh, contribution. And I have to thank also, of course, the sponsors to make this day uh, possible the Dutch government, uh, real publishers, and also the Association of Low Countries Studies. Um, most of the day, just a little of practical, most of the day will be here downstairs for the reception. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll move to the third floor where we set up a little exhibition on the Low Countries collection and uh, the work of Peter Hell, which is, and it, this, this uh, uh, room is very close to the old Low Countries room where the Low Countries used to be. So there's even a little bit of history in the location. Um, how this day works is we'll have in, in the morning uh, two sets of two lectures, in the afternoon two sets of three lectures. Uh, I think we'll uh, have the lectures first and then have the questions at the end of each uh, session. Uh, so without further ado, let's, let's kick things off. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, welcoming our first speaker. It's uh, Professor Peter van Hees. If there is anyone who can be considered a connoisseur of the life and works of Peter Gale and, and one of the main scholars who worked uh, on uh, his legacy and private life. Uh, it is uh, Professor Van Hees, uh, who uh, uh, has his album Amicorum, if you can look at it, is even called Nationalism and Historiography Rondon uh, Peter Gale. 
he was very active in uh, publishing the archive that, that is in the uh, Infectious University Library, uh, correspondence with uh, colleagues, Kell's autobiography, and many, many more. And um, Professor Van Hees will talk to us today about Kell and his the more political views of his uh, uh, legacy, namely the greater uh, Netherlands. So, Mr. Van Hees, I think you uh, Gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, some words on Peter Kell and the great greater benevolence idea. As a student at Leiden University in the years uh, 1907 till 1912, Kell had his first encounters with Flanders and the Flemish people. He discovered the language struggle, the fight for more political rights, to use the Flemish language in a strongly French-dominated Unitarian Belgian state. At the same time, in the Netherlands, there was a newly awakened interest in the Dutch language. The Dutch were proud that their language was spoken worldwide. In the Dutch colonies, the East and West Indies, in Flanders, of course, in the United States, and not unimportantly, in South Africa, where the struggles of the Boers against English imperialism was followed with keen interest. After the First World War, Gell's interest in Flanders brought him again in touch with Flanders and the Flemish-Dutch relations. In these contexts, he propagated his idea of an ideal state formed by the Netherlands-speaking people in the Netherlands and Belgium. In the propaganda for that idea, he developed two aspects, an historical one and a political one. First, some remarks on the greater Netherlands in the writing of history. The historian Gell developed an alternative way of looking upon the birth of the Netherlands in the 16th century. In a series of lectures here in London in 1920 and later in Belgium and the Netherlands, he postulated the thesis that the dividing line in the 17 Burgundian states coming into existence by the common resistance against the policy of centralization by the Spanish king Philip II was the result of accidental military circumstances. The victories of the Spanish commander, Parma, over the stage, which had started their struggle against the Spanish tyranny, had caused a permanent division between the Dutch-speaking states. In the opinion of the Dutch historians, this division became permanent and had been caused by a deep difference in national character between the North and the South. The difference was determined by the tenacity of the Northern states, the future Dutch Republic, in their struggle for the old liberties, for the freedom of religion for the Calvinists, and the loyalty to the stadtholders of the House of Orange. Gell regretted this division and dismissed the deterministic opinions. In his eyes, the cause could be found in the accidental elements of the military situation. Gell pointed out that Parma had not been able to cross the great rivers, and for that reason, the northern states could stay free. At the same time, he criticized the Belgian historian Henri Piren, who, just like hell, brought the falling apart of the Burgundian states. However, Piren saw an advantage in the division, namely the state staying together of the states Brabant and Flanders, the nucleus of the later state Belgium. Flanders, Brabant, and the other speaking states fought in Piren's eyes, as he had stated earlier, a fortuitous combination of economic and cultural factors. The cultural factor 
was the coexistence of the Latin and German culture, the famous Amber region. The other factor of the two regions were economically complementary. There was much re resistance against Hell's newly found opinions. He challenged values and opinions which had long had been long time certainties among Dutch historians. It was considered arrogance to criticize highly esteemed authorities, and he was accused of mixing history and politics, a matter which Hell readily defended. He claimed, I see, quote, politics and history have much to gain from each other, the first in depth and the second in the sense for reality. End of quotation. In the Netherlands, Hell attacked the consolidated opinions of, among others, Robert Fram, his Hell's tutor, Peter Block, and Kohlebrand and Kankan, to name some of the historians with a more liberal background. But also Protestant historians, as Hoslika and the Pater, were not amused. His vision, however, found much approval by Roman Catholic historians as Robina. Gaal's critical appreciation of Kierensky's strategy was with, according to Gaal, its too dirty deterministic view of the division of the Burgundian states and the development of the southern Netherlands after 1579, the Union of Arab, was rejected by Belgium the Belgian historical establishment, formed by people as Terlinde, Van Hoogde, Van der Esse, and Van Bergen. Gel's critical views were embraced, however, by young Flemish historians as Elias and Van Rosen. On the other hand, we see that some French-speaking Belgian historians, such as Alcun, wished to give more attention to the French-speaking regions in Belgium. More interesting is that former opponents of Geil, like Van Hoogde and Van der Esse and Van Werwijken, could appreciate Geil's less deterministic view explanation of the division of the Netherlands. Even Van Werwijken and Van der Esse would cooperate with Geil in editing Geil's periodical the Netherlands historiebladen in the end of the surplus. And then the history of the geschiedenis van de Nederlandse stad. Geld summarized his historical Greater Netherlands opinions in the history of the Netherlands, Netherlandish speaking people in, of the low, in the Low Countries. The first volume was published in 1930 under the title Geschiedenis van de Nederlandse stad. The later English translations of other titles. He used the notion of stam in the title of the book because, in his view, unity of language should form the natural borders of a future federal union of the Netherlands and Flanders. That union might have existed if the Netherlands had not been divided by the barrier of the rivers in the 16th century. It was a possibilistic approach of history and at the same time, not without some finalism. In the end, the unity of language between the North and the South played hardly a role in the 16th till 18th century. There was little awareness of the common language between the inhabitants of the North and the South. Weak points in Hell's narrative were the unclear definition of the borders in the eastern part of the Netherlands, and not enough attention to the French-speaking territories in the Bougainian state. Historians generally accepted Hell's claim that the revolt in the Netherlands had been a conservative revolution. This critical view of the violent action of the liberty fighters, the sea beggars, was accepted with mixed feelings. The importance of his research is to be found in the nowadays generally accepted insight that the division of 
the Burgundian Netherlands was caused by a series of accidentally, mostly military events. <coughs> These events were not caused by Parma not being able to cross the Great Rivers. That's a fallacy. But lack of money to pay the soldiers was the real factor. Studies of Elliot and Parker show that clearly. Another point is that Gell's nationalism theory, theory was more and more criticized. His language nationalism was a typically 19th century phenomenon that, the 19th, uh, that in the 19th and the first part of the 20th century was widely spread and accepted. But in the 20th century, in the late 20s, these ideas had a lot in common with theories of national socialism, with the connection, language, race, Blutenbogen, and author authoritarian leadership. Theories which Hell clearly and frequently dismissed. His stem idea was based on the notion of unity of language and was purely founded in cultural facts. Then, but there was more. Hell's successor in London, his friend Gustav Renier, well known here in this house, is his, uh, in his inaugural in our mural lecture, the criterion of Dutch nationhood rejected language as the most important factor in creating a nation state. He believed in the factor of common history, as worded by Ernest Renan in Avoir fait des grands choses ensemble et d'en faire encore. Renier's successor, Ernst Kosman, who also was professor here in London, wrote a history of the Low Countries, a comparative history of Belgium and the Netherlands in the 19th and 20th century. He saw Belgium and the Netherlands as independent states, and the partly common language was for him not a special point of interest. In the Algemene Geschiedenis der Nederlanden, the general history of the Netherlands, that was initiated after 1945, language was not a factor at all. Geography determined the division in chapters. That was the reason why Gell declined to contribute to this project. It's remarkable that Gell did not finish the Geschiedenis van de Nederlandse stam. It ended in 1798. Of course, after 1945, there were other subjects in the field of historiography and the theory of history which got his head's attention and brought him fame. But the question arises, didn't he himself believe or lost faith in this project? There's something to say about it. On the other hand, his views in the 1970s, on the 70s and 18th centuries which brought together in this stump are still of some importance. Interesting is that much material for these views were found in British archives when he lived in London. And last but not least, his stump served the propaganda for the political greater Netherlands state. And some words on the political greater Netherlands now. Hence, the Greater Netherlands idea had, as said before, a political aspect. The idea of a federal Netherlands state created by the Flanders, by the Netherlands and Flanders, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, after 1918 appealed to radical Flanders. The radical Flanders were a compromise of two groups which after 1918 reluctantly worked together. One group consisted of the Front Soviets, who had fought along the river Eiser, of which some had joined a secret organization which strived for better conditions for the Flemings after the war. Many of them preferred the federal Belgium. The same thoughts were alive among the so-called activists Flemings who had cooperated 
with the German occupying forces in 1914-1918. The idea of a greater Netherlands state was not rejected, but at the same time, it was not, well, it was not the most favored solution. It's interesting that on the Wallonian side of Belgium, ideas of separation or federalism were also to be found. Separately, the old frontiers, front soldiers and the activists were not numerous, but they decided to work together and formed a political party, Front Party, which in 1919 obtained five seats in a parliament out of 186 seats. It's quite a minority. They could only function as a pressure group. That they did. But the results were all the same small. And they were many times undermined by internal conflicts and some great dumb ideas. Just to give one uh, example. When Michel visited Anton Jacob, an activist in prison, and he visited him in prison, Jacob told Michel that he had a dream. Had had a dream. He should like to go to the little Flemish town here with 100 men prepared to die to occupy that little city for about 24 hours just to make a statement. Luckily, it stayed a dream. But it gives a bit an idea of the sometimes uh, unrealistic views they had. Many quarrels, quarrels were stimulated by the activists who in 1980 had asked sanctuary in the Netherlands. They were supported by members of the Dietzebond and the Dietz Studentenverband. Those two unions propagated political support to the Flemings. It goes without saying that Gell's idea of a greater Netherlands state was popular in those circles. Popular in a small community of a few thousand members but absolutely not popular by the people in the Netherlands that didn't believe in any attachment to Flanders. The Dutch government was also opposed to the attachment, and the same case made in Belgium. Gans' ideas might have fallen in fertile soil, but they didn't bear fruit. As I said, there were always conflicts, heated discussions, and much distrust. Despite his impatience and sometimes radical language, Kell tried to moderate between the groups. His efforts to moderate and mediate can be explained <coughs> by his knowledge of the struggle between Ireland, Ulster, and England. Knowledge of these struggles may have brought him to favor moderation in the discussion on national identities. In his opinion, the greater Netherlands state was something for the far, far future and had to be realized by parliamentary action and not by revolution. But the refugees in the Netherlands and many members in the Front Party had other ideas. They wanted to demolish the Belgian state. Hell always tried to bring these parties together and planned for cooperation. His object was to create a federal Belgium with good conditions for the Flemish citizens. His tactics didn't work. In the late 20s and early 30s, many Flemish nationalists, nationalists made a choice for radicalism and national socialism. Ger warned against those ideas, but it was a Vox Clamans in this era. In fact, in the mid-30s, he already stood outside the Greater Netherlands movement. But Flanders kept a place in his heart. After 1945, he renewed his contacts, 
the political dimension, the political dimension of the Greater Netherlands idea was out of the question and out of the picture. But he supported the Flemish and the Flemish Dutch relations via the technical commission, an executive commission of the Belgian Dutch Cultural Treaty of 1946. The task of this commission was promoting culture, education, and care for the Dutch language. At the same time, in his letters and during his visits to Flanders, he advocated a narrow cooperation between socialist, Catholic, and liberal parties in Flanders. During his life, the results of all these efforts were small. An explanation might be that Gell underestimated the antithesis between the clerical and anti-clerical Belgians. Since the end of the 19th century, liberals, socialists, feared the domination of Catholic Flanders. And because we have uni uh, the Belgian party system was based on the, the Unitarian state, so the Flemish uh, Catholics party in Flanders <coughs> need to uh, keep always an eye on their colleagues in Bologna and uh, make together front against the socialists, the liberals, etc. And that uh, made also uh, the legislation in Flemish directions uh, rather difficult. In conclusion, it's clear that Gell's views regarding the separation in the Burgundian Habsburg states have brought some new insights in the form of a politic possibilistic approach of the past. In politics, his greater, greater Netherlands state was a utopia. But Gell saw in the 30s the possibility of a federal Belgium, and that became a reality in 1973. He didn't live to see it because he died in 1966. And that was a tra tragedy for a man who said that the Flemish question had dominated his life. Thank you.